Thanks, Steve. I have two confessions. I have two confessions that you're going to find out about this morning. Um, I love singing, um, but I'm hopeless at it. Unless the song's got one low note, um, I'm sorry, I sing out of tune. But I really like belting out a song, uh, usually in the car, when no one can hear me except the car. Um, I also get very emotional at times. Um, end of a good movie, <sighs> there's me with a box of tissues. Um, there's one particular song that uh, I usually play in the car at my daughter's birthday. Uh, I, I had a, yeah, on her birthday, it's called Butterfly Kisses. It came out in the 90s. And it's a song about the relationship between a dad and his daughter. So when I play that song in the car, I'm usually a, a bawling mess and I can't see a thing. I probably shouldn't do that in the car while I'm driving. Um, so Steve asked me um, and reminded me last week about this and um, how do you pick a song that has a, an emotional connection and, and has a story. Um, Steve said it doesn't have to be a Christian song. Um, there was a song written in the 70s by a guy called Ralph Mattel. It's called The Streets of London. Um, and it talks about the destitution and loneliness of people who have no home and live on the streets of London. But apart from the fact that that song also breaks me up, it has no story. Um, this, is, this is the story about the song, uh, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Um, at my previous church, we played this song a lot. It was one of my favorites. Um, it was low, I felt I could sing it, I played it a lot. It was a fairly short hymn and I got to know the words. Um, it was my favourite hymn. Another side of my life, for a long time, I've, I've been rock climbing and mountaineering uh, way too much and I found myself on a mountain in Tibet. Um, of the 1.2 million named mountains in the world, there are only 14 above 8,000 metres. And uh, in my climbing career, I always fancied myself a good chance of climbing an 8,000 metre peak. Um, most of them are in Nepal, which means you need a lot of money to go and climb it. Uh, all but one of the rest are in Pakistan and uh, there's a fine line between your ability to climb it and the risk involved and there was way too much risk involved in not just Pakistan but on those mountains. But there's one in Tibet called Shisha Pangma, uh, a bit over 8,000 metres high, 26,000 feet in the old money. And I was leading a group of four Australians on the mountain and I found myself at our second highest camp. Uh, I felt strong and healthy and well acclimatised. Um, but my climbing partner uh, developed frostbite in his fingers. So they're stuck in a camp in a little tent in the snow at minus 20. Um, Warwick's fingers weren't too bad. They'd turned white. That, that's not a bad thing. And uh, we are on the mountain with a, a group of Canadians, 16 Canadians. We'd shared the transport costs to the mountain with them, but we climbed independently. Anyway, not far away, there was the Canadian second summit team. And I knew there were only three in the team and they really wanted four. And one of them came over to our tent and said, we've got a spare spot on the summit team. Would one of you like to join us? 
Uh, Warwick and I weren't going any further with his frostbitten fingers, but they weren't too bad, and I talked to him and I said, look, would you mind if I tried for the summit? And he said, no, that's all right. So I said yes to the Canadians. Next morning, uh, Warwick's fingers had turned black. Um, so he was going down. <laughs> and, um, and it's funny how sometimes the hardest decisions in your life are also the easiest. So I went across to the Canadians and said, sorry, I'm not going with you, I'm taking Warwick back down. So Warwick and I, uh, he couldn't do anything with his fingers, they were in mittens and wrapped up and I dressed them as best I could. We went down 6,000 feet to base camp. So for the next two days, I would go back up to collect our gear and clean our equipment and food from the mountain. And the Canadians summited, good for them. But they were also stuck at their top camp. Yeah, minus 40, 100 mile an hour winds, they were stuck there for three nights. Um, there weren't any people in the Canadian team left over who were capable of uh, any sort of effort on the mountain and um, the Canadians asked me if I could organise a search and rescue. For the guys stuck at top camp. Anyway, um, so I uh, continued up and down the mountain on the glacier and I was singing when I surveyed the wondrous cross. I was convinced that we would have a funeral and a burial on the mountain. Um, so I was singing this I guess as a prayer to, um, for these people stuck at top camp. And also I thought, well, if I'm going to host a funeral, I should have at least one song that we can sing. Anyway, as it turned out, uh, one of the Canadians came with me on our <laughs> glorious search and rescue. Um, the, uh, the people at top camp actually managed to get out in a lull of the storm at midnight and they met us halfway down. One of them collapsed in my arms uh, in tears and said, look, we thought we'd never get out. The wind was blowing the rocks around. Anyway, so um, when Steve asked me to do this, I thought this, is, this thing's got a really emotional hook in me. And I think about Christ and God and mountaineering and death and all sorts of things when I sing this song. So please, let's sing it. I'll be the one up the back singing out of tune <laughs> with a box of tissues. Thank you. And during this song, we'll be taking up the offering as well. Please stand. Yes. 
Please be seated. 